First Timothy chapter four, verse two down through verse five. Uh, we um, we 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 came through some of that, and I'll read a passage or two there, and then we'll continue on and try to conclude these thoughts on the Sunday school hour this morning. And uh, I didn't change my lesson for uh, Resurrection Sunday. I figured, well, Pastor may bring a message on the resurrection. I don't know or whoever. But we'll see what happens. I'll stay with the stuff here and just go verse by verse. But he says, The Spirit, now the Spirit, that be the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly. That means he's not, not beating around the bush here. He's telling you expressly. Uh, it's not maybe, not I hope so. It's expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, uh, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctors and devils. And a couple weeks ago we taught, not last week, but the week before, we taught on those things. We got on through that, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's about where we got to. We didn't get far, far at all. But um, there's a lot in the scriptures about these things. And these are wonderful warnings, if you please. Wonderful warnings for the church that the church might guard itself against some of the things in the last days. And, uh, and if we don't uh, heed a warning and we don't take heed to guard ourselves against some of these things, it will cause more heartaches and more troubles than necessary. So uh, we talk a little about that seared conscience thing. Uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I didn't comment on this two weeks ago, but I, I just I had too many thoughts on it to get it all in last time. But this time, let's talk about it. Um, the conscience, the, the Holy Spirit has used the word conscience here in the Scriptures. So anytime the word is chosen by the Holy Spirit and, and we find it in our English King James Bible... We need to pay attention to it and its proper definition. That's how it always is with anything in the Scriptures. That's how you study the Word of God, understanding the definitions to the words and the context that they're found in, and that leads to uh, many uh, thoughts on why God would do that. So that's kind of how we're approaching this. And that uh, conscious, the word is defined by dictionary, uh, is the inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motives. Now, you say, well, everybody's got a conscience. Now, some people, I know some people ain't even got a conscience. Could I say this today? Everybody, including Jeffrey Dahmer, draws the line somewhere. Some people draw it here. <laughs> some, some people, I can't even go far enough, draw it way over there. So everybody, if you're a human being and you are in charge of most of your faculties, <laughs> means you can come and go and get your face fed and, you know, those things, you'll have some kind of inner dealing or thinking or seat. We could use the word seat. Uh, it's referred to in the scripture as your conscience, which in turn is like when the Bible says uh, with the heart or your whole being, your whole inner being. But here conscience is that seat of reasoning. Should I or shouldn't I? <laughs> and um, you know, everybody can get on this page. When you reach for that next biscuit this morning and that next spoonful of gravy or whatever they were serving, I heard pancakes. You said, should I or shouldn't I? And if you're like me, you said, sure, why not? Sunrise Sunday only comes once a year. So <laughs> you say, well, and you deal with yourself in there. Now, somewhere in the conscience... A person can be, here's a Bible word, pricked by the Holy Ghost of God or the Word of God. 
For when Saul was on the Damascus road going to persecute Christians because he was a Pharisee and he was on business for the, the Jews and the Judaizers of the day, the, if you please, the, the Pharisaical Sanhedrin, he was going to go incarcerate, kill, throw to the lions those that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ appeared to him that day and blinded him. <laughs> kind of an unusual situation. And he said to him, uh, Lord, Lord, who art thou? And he told him, and he used some of these words. He says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he meant the pricks of the Holy Spirit of God uh, that worked on his conscience to do right or to do wrong. Can I say this this morning? Everybody kind of has that. Some folks get are a little harder than others. We could use that term. So with that basis, let's finish the, the definition. A, a, the conscious is defined by dictionary definition as, as is the inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motive impelling one toward right action to follow the dictates of conscience. Uh, the complex or ethical and moral principles that controls or inhibits the actions or thoughts of an individual. Now, the dictionary uses moral principles uh, or the complex of ethical and moral principles, simply meaning that everything we could think to do is not necessarily ethical, but if we keep them to ourselves, we can fool the multitudes. Yeah, you know kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> um, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So be careful what kind of thoughts you let yourself think, and you think, well, nobody knows what I'm thinking. God does. And he knoweth the thought afar of off, and he's omnipotent. He's every place at all times, and you can't get away from him. And David said, even if, if I should be in hell, thou art there. So it looks like the ability to think and to remember stays with a person even after death because that rich man opened his eyes in hell and he could remember what was going on. Boy, the memory's a, an awesome thing. The conscious, the inner seat of the sense of the inside of a person. So here, we'll look at it again. He says, speaking lies of actually having their conscience or their inner seat, their being, their, their ability to sense between right and wrong uh, he says their conscience seared with a hired iron. Now we've got another word that comes up and we have to define these words so we can get the right teaching from the text. The word seared. Most people think of the word, and let me just say the word seared. I don't know if I wrote the dictionary definition down here. I probably didn't, but everybody's got a seared. Okay, smart. If you've got a smartphone, you can look it up quick or any kind of dictionary, but seared means, means to be, if you please, burnt over. Or, okay, how many of you said, okay, I, I like my steak medium rare. You know, sear it on the one side, sear it on the other side, and bring it to me. I don't like mine rare like that. But they sear it on one side or the other side. If you were getting ready to cook a roast, and I'm not a cook or a baker or any of that, but if I, somewhere along the line, get a big pot out, and I've probably seen it on one of them cooking shows, and they throw a piece of meat in there, and they sear it on all those sides. They sear it, or they burn it over. They seal it with, with the heat from that pot or that skillet, and then they they may leave it in the same pot, put a lid on it, throw it in the oven at 350, and two hours later, voila, you got a 
Say, why do they do that? To seal in the juices, to seal something in or to protect it or preserve it so uh, something in it couldn't get out or something outside couldn't get in. So the term is used here as seared, as though with a hot iron. So we get the indication that heat sears things. You all have all watched Gunsmoke, I know, and you know they're pulling that arrow out of Matt Dillon, you know, and man, what we, I'm, 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 if, if he was shot as many times he was shot... Never mind. And they got this poker in the fire, and they don't want him to bleed to death, and they stick that poker to that, and they sear that thing. Uh, obviously, that must have been a way to stop the bleeding or to sear it. And I think today they cauterize things. Don't they cauterize things? Is that you nurses? They, they use something hot to cauterize an artery or blood vessel or something to keep it and it sears it, and basically what you're doing in a minute way is to sear that thing. So that's kind of the definition, the term that, we, that the Holy Spirit is used here. And I remember having planter's warts on my feet. Anybody ever had that? I was just a kid, just a kid. But I couldn't walk. I'm, I, <laughs> so my mom and my dad said, take him down to old Doc Seferman. He'll do the surgery right there in his office. He did. <laughs> he cut them off with a razor blade. <laughs> then he took something hot and seared it. I remember that flesh burning. You remember? Anybody? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Say, what is that? That's searing it, man. <laughs> so here, the Holy Spirit, the use of his words are, uh, as we read here, in connection to the conscience speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So it's, it's about these false teachers and these liars, these hypocrites. Uh, their conscience is seared to making any kind of ethical, good, reasonable sense out of things that would be salutary, wholesome, and good. And they just, they're seared to it. They they're not going to do it. They can't do it. Their conscience is seared, kind of like Romans chapter 1, not exactly the same, where a man is given over to a reprobate mind and he does not like to retain the knowledge of God. They would rather worship the creation than the creator, something like that. And we, we got that today. And so here the warning to us is he's talking about the speaking expressly and he's, he's not beating around the bush. So he's going to use some very pointed words uh, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seduce the spirits, doctrines of devils. So all these things in a negative sense are connected with this speaking lies and hypocrisy. So they're going to tell lies and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You ever run across somebody that could just lie to you just as straight looking right at you and just lie to you and boy he could sell you he could sell you an old Buick telling you the whole time it's a Volkswagen and have you believe in it say I think I got some relatives like that I <laughs> I think we all do <laughs> you say what what is that that's a conscience void of doing anything right and they don't mind lying to you to, to, to tell you, to get, it, get accomplish what they want, to, their devious deeds accomplished, and they'll just lie to you as soon as look at you. Well, now into the sense of this here, he's talking about false teachers and people that stand before people that teach the Word of God. He said, you're going to have a whole bunch of people out there that's, that's they're hypocrites, and they're going to lie to you, and their conscience is seared. It's, it's been... It's been fried, if you please. And it can't tell the truth. It won't tell the truth. It's, it has succumbed to the searing. Good warning. So the, the scriptures having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, I notice when I look in the scripture, uh, the conscience is a very important thing. Uh, and I should take your Bible just for a moment and think with me if you would about John 8 and verse 9. Let me give you a couple things on uh, the conscience. Knowing that the conscience is the inner seat of that man 
And that's where he has the ability to, to govern right from wrong. And you wonder, why in the world today are so many people doing the wrong thing? Could I submit unto you their conscience has been seared by, by something evil? C can I submit this unto you while you're turning to John? That we are geared as American people to believe the lie rather than the truth? Everything that you watch on TV, be careful. Very little of it is truth. Your reality TV shows, your Alaskan bush people, they come out and said that's all a farce, that those people don't live like that, blah, blah. What is it? It's a lie. But man, don't tell us that. We love that. We, leave us alone. Man, we're enjoying. We are geared to believe the lie. And then could I say this this morning? I believe as a teacher of the Word of God and a preacher of the Word of God who tries to handle a lot of the truth and listen to the truth of the Word of God on a daily basis, I believe that a lot of American people, could I say this? I'm getting close to home here, and I know it's sunrise, sunny, and everything. But a lot of folks, even in the church, would rather have the lie than the truth. Yeah. Say why? They can't help it. They're seared to it. They've been seared by the news media. They've been seared by the world. They've been seared by the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And they just love all that stuff. And they say, hey, hey, tell us a lie. Lie to us again. We love it. Nobody really wants the truth as bad as they want the lie. Oh, I've just got off the subject here. I could, oh, let me get back. John 8, 9. I'm just kidding. John 8, 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. So their conscience was still able to discern between right and wrong. Went out one by one beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And by the way, as you read the rest of that, he said, go and sin no more. She was taken in adultery and brought by a bunch of men, religious hypocrites, that's the picture, to Jesus to see what Jesus would do with this woman that was taken in adultery. Now the law said, bring them both and let them both be stoned. And when Jesus got to writing on the ground there, he said their conscience was convicted. Can I submit unto you today, still the Bible entertains the thought as, as conviction in the conscience. So what brings that? The Lord God brings that. The Word of God brings that. Say, what he write on the ground? It doesn't matter. If he drew pictures, if he drew stick men, if he wrote the law down, it doesn't matter. They were convicted, if you please, in their conscience or in their innermost sense, in their heart. And because I believe they were guilty, from the youngest to the eldest, all got up and walked out of that place because they were guilty of the same sin they had brought her for, basically what's going on, and they were convicted in their conscience. conscience. Can, can I say today that the conscience can be convicted by the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God still yet today? You want to know why people get upset when somebody gets up and preaches or teaches the Word of God, especially if they're, you know, as we say down home, shelling the corn. Man, he was shelling the corn today or shucking the corn today. What's that mean? Man, preach another message. We like that hellfire and damnation preaching. Just got, well, you know, then you'll get people jumping up in the middle of the service and walking out and making the disturbance and kids crying and people going, say, what's going on? People resisting the truth of the Word of God. Just wait till about invitation time and you know God's been doing something convicted in the hearts and lives of people and people are sitting there knowing they need to trust Christ as their Savior and there'll be somebody get up, put their coat on, stumble over about half the things and get up and walk out of the service right about the most important time in the service. Say, what is that? That's somebody with a seared conscience. What? Now, if you're sick and having trouble, 
gut kidney failure, diarrhea. I got it. I got it. I'm, not, I'm just saying. But those that will not set under the preaching of the Word of God or the teaching of the Word of God, and they find an excuse to leave the service at that time, there's something wrong with their conscience. Their conscience is telling them that right is wrong and wrong is right. That good is bad and bad is good. You know the book of Malachi says that that's what they were doing in the last days. They were calling good bad and bad good, evil good and good evil. They had that thing turned around. You say, why? Their conscience was seared because they believed the lie so long, so long, so long, so long. When the truth comes along, they just reject it. They They've lied so much, so many times, they'd rather hear the lie than the truth every time. And I'm telling you, it's a spiritual warfare, and the spiritual beings that come into services and that are everywhere that were in Jesus' day and are still here today, you can call them what you want. The Bible calls them devils, evil spirits, seducing spirits the bible used here and we're in context because he said they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and there's going to be some people that have believed that have had their conscience seared for the truth and the word of god and they will not receive the word of god they will not receive the man of god they will not receive the things of god but they'll receive the things of the world and the things of the deceivers and the hypocrites say uh you think that's it brother phil i don't think that's it the bible says that's it now let me give you another one i showed you there where uh, the there's a convicted conscience conscience Look, if you would, at, and I think a lot of people are right here. Take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's dealing with a young church. And they're uh, definitely weak. They're definitely carnal. And by the way, they're recorded and left for us. They're a picture of kind of where the church is today. Uh, amen. In pretty bad shape. Now watch, I want to show you a weak conscience. People have a weak conscience. That means it's not quick to exercise its abilities in discerning right when things of wrong are shown to it. Now you would expect a child to be like that. You know, you have a child and they might have a weak conscience because they haven't grown up yet and they haven't uh, learned everything that they might need to learn. And, and that's why we don't want our children around uh, older, evil folks. Because the scripture says evil communications corrupt good manners. Say why? Because they're weak in conscience and they can be, they can be swayed. Have you ever heard of peer pressure? Well, yeah, everybody's doing it. You need to do it. Well, a young person with a weak conscience may say, well, I know it's not right to do, but boy, I want to be in the in crowd, so I'll do it. And they do it. And brother, if you start living a life like that, giving into that thing, giving into that thing, giving into that thing, thinking, well, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and jerking the, the text, the Scripture out of the text to prove that you can live any way you want to live when the Bible doesn't teach that at all, brother, you'll be 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, and you won't have any kind of a conscience. Because you've just done what you wanted to do. Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. He says here, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, same, you think I'm out of context. I'm not, because back in our text in 1 Timothy, in chapter 4, you're going to see where some of them abstain from eating meats and it has to do with idolatry and it has to do with a weak conscience or a conscience that has been seared to those things that are right and good you say well what how does that happen living for yourself 
saying yes to your flesh every time it wants something, saying no to God every time you're convicted, and you'll go through life with a weak conscience making a whole lot of bad decisions. Well, nobody will ever know. That book knows. The Holy Ghost of God knows. You realize there's only two perfect things we got down here. It's not your preacher's. It's the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. And they're still working in full capacity. And they're having to work with folks with seared consciences. Why do you think Paul told Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier? He wasn't talking about hardness in the land. Every time the word hardness shows up in the King James Bible in the New Testament, it is in reference to somebody's heart. God was talking about the hearts of people that are hard. You say, what's wrong with them? The heart and the conscience are almost synonymous in the fact that when it's seared over, you can't deal with it. Oh, Oh, man. Yeah, Merry Easter. Oh, no, that's Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry, happy Easter. There we go. God. Okay. A seared conscience. That's in our text, 1 Timothy 4, 2. Let me show you an evil conscience. There's people with an evil conscience. They'll lie to you in a heartbeat. They'll cheat on their wife in a heartbeat. They'll, and they're all the whole time calling themselves to be Christians. They're great folks. It, they, they'll tell you, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. Man, I'm talented, I'm educated, I'm, I smile all the time, I got my teeth fixed, I'm not too fat. You know, they'll just go down the whole list of everything that they think is so great, and they'll treat, they'll treat everybody else. Well, when you get into the home, they'll treat their wife like a dog and everybody else's wife like she was the queen of Sheba. Say, what's wrong with that? Conscience messed up, man. Let me show you that thing. Take your Bible and go to Hebrews chapter 10, at least you think... No, the Bible is not silent. Matter of fact, seven times the Bible talks of seven different things that the conscience is capable of or does, and the Holy Spirit doesn't put something in the Bible seven times for us to fly past and say, oh, it, it doesn't say anything about that. No, he's sounding the warning, sounding the warning, sounding the warning. Watch out for your inner conscience and your heart and keep that thing right. Tender. Watch this. Here, thing in Hebrews 10, 22. The scripture says this. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Uh, and I'm sorry, let me get it. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That evil conscience is something that's in every person that's born on the face of the earth. Why do you think all people every place from birth up until they're seven, eight, nine years old or whenever have the propensity to lie to you? <laughs> Matter of fact, they ain't ever going to tell you the truth. Screaming and hollering, carrying on. That kind of thing. You say, why? They, they're born with that. And you need a heart transplant. You need a heart change. And a lot of folks, when they get a heart change, if they don't get in the Word of God and something pure and around something pure and something holy, which is the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God, brother, they'll live, they'll live their whole life with a conscience void or an evil conscience prone to do wrong, prone to cheat, prone to any time they get a chance to do something to better themselves and hurt somebody else. Oh, you don't believe that. I believe there's plenty of Christians sitting in plenty of churches that would do you wrong to better their self in a heartbeat and call it okay. I've worked out in the secular world all my life. I've owned a business all, just about all my life. And I hate to tell you this, but I'd rather work for a lost Catholic than somebody backslid on God that claims they're saved. <gasps> oh, Brother Phil, I'm telling you, because the brother, quote unquote, wants to do the brother thing, quote unquote, and expects you to go along with him. Where the Catholic who doesn't know Christ, possibly some of them do, some of them don't. And I have a friend, 
he was a Catholic, but he said he didn't believe like I believe. But you know what? That guy was honest as the day is long. If honesty would get you to heaven, he'd go. But I'm ashamed to say today, honesty don't get you to heaven. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does. You've got to trust Christ. Now that's say, what is that? It's spun out of an evil conscience. That's what he's talking about in 1 Timothy 4, 2. It's seared. Look at the defiled conscience. Take your Bible and go to Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Titus 1, 15. He says, unto the pure all things are pure. Now, there's not many pure folks running around. There'll be some hypocrites that'll try to tell you they're pure. And then they'll try to tell you what they're doing is pure when you've got a book to line it up with. And if it don't line up with the book, I got news for you. The book ain't wrong. They're wrong. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So I don't care how hypocritical they are, how high up the religious ladder they've climbed, how many DDs and PhDs and THDs they got behind their name. If they're dishonest, they're crooks and their conscience is seared. When I read the book of Job, one thing that Job never lost was his integrity. And brother, when a person loses their integrity, especially a man of God, he's lost everything. And that's, that's somebody that'll lie to you. That'll twist it their way, not the Scripture's way. That'll take their preference over, thus saith the Lord. Say, what is that? That's an evil conscience. Now, I said here in the book of Titus, uh, there was that defiled conscience. Look at Titus 1.15. Um, let me get that right. See if that's right. That's 3.15. Let me back up. 1.15. Here we go. He says, Un unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And there the Holy Spirit puts mind and conscience together. A lot of people say, well, the conscience isn't the mind. No, the mind and the conscience are the one thing. That's where things are thought out. That's where things are premeditated. That's where things are settled. It starts in the mind. Somebody preached here on a Wednesday night, brother, the, the battle that the devil puts you in is a battle of the mind. And who whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of those which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of God should shine unto them. Brother, the battle's in the mind. That's the seat of the senses. That's called the conscience. And here, you can have a defiled conscience. You ever get around somebody that's been, had a defiled mind? Brother, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. You can listen to somebody talk for a little bit and just about know what's on their mind. If they're always talking about this, 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 and this, mark it down. They're defiled with that thing, especially if it's vile. They're talking about the Lord, that's a good thing. But if they're talking about somebody else's wife and somebody else's wife and somebody's wife they work with and this and that and, that, and that's how it goes. Well, I don't know why my wife don't want nothing to do with me, and you always got your hands on somebody else, and you're always talking to somebody else. You've got a defiled conscience, and your conscience is seared and won't receive the truth. And when the truth comes along, you say, oh, that's not truth. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm out of time, folks. That's... Uh, there's three more. There's a pure conscience talked about in Hebrews 9.14. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a purged conscience. So your conscience can be purged by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews 9, 14. There's the pure conscience, uh, which is by all things purged by the Word of God. Gird up the loins of your mind with the Word of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9 in the book of Peter. And then there's a thing called a good conscience. I trust today we've got a good conscience, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse Verse 15, seared with a hot iron. I've got to quit there. I've got to stop. But there's a lot in the Bible on a warning to us about what goes on in our minds, how we think, what our preferences are, and how that appears to everybody else. Do you appear Christ-like or do you appear Phil-like? Oh, don't go there. Whew. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. So every day we get up, we want to be Christ-like. Say, why? He had a perfect mind. Amen.
a good conscience. We better pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your, your folks. Thank you for the Word of God. and Thank you for, Lord, how it teaches us and brings us along and shows us uh, the things to watch out for. Thank you for the warning that you've given us here. Protect the church and the things of God. In Jesus' name I pray and ask it. Amen. Good, good, good morning.